hello everyone. Welcome to our first solutions meeting. Join us once a month on the first Wednesday. Polio, our story. What's yours? I'm Mona and I like to talk to people about their polio experiences. Throughout my young adult life, I left polio behind and I moved on with living as a capable adult. I never had any contact with others who had polio and I was just doing great. My isolation from others with polio left me ill-equipped for what was to happen 33 years later. So now I tried to talk to everyone who had polio and hear their stories. My story, my twin brother and I developed polio at 14 months old. He recovered 100% and I was left with lower limb involvement. I used to walk very long distances with only crutches for support. Then suddenly from an incorrect treatment, I could no longer walk as much or as far and no one could figure out why. I went to I went to every doctor in Montreal. Well, almost everyone. No one knew what was wrong. I kept looking until I found someone and now skip ahead 35 years later. Wham bam, post polio syndrome. Susie, what's your post polio story? What made you realize you had post polio? I'm going to try and put like 78 years into five minutes here, okay? I was a polio kid. At seven months, my dad took me to the hospital because I wasn't breathing, and they put me in an iron lung. Um, doctors said I would never walk again. My dad didn't agree, took me out of the hospital. I learned to swim before I learned to walk. Eventually, I wore a big, of course, as we're all, many of us are used to, steel brace with leather on it to keep it all together. Um, I grew up um, with things that I hid from other people, obviously. Um, couldn't jump, couldn't run, things like that. Um, couldn't walk very far. Um, learned to ride a bike because that's where I could get uh, the most mileage out of. But when did my post polio hit? It hit when I was pregnant with my first child. Um, I had always been exhausted. I had always taken naps as a kid and even as a college student. I mean, naps were built into my schedule. But when I became pregnant, I found I was totally exhausted. Um, I also lost my voice. And you can tell I have a very low, hoarse voice. This is, and I'll give you as we go through it, a little nursing stuff here and there. Um, because I have a hiatal hernia and I have vagus nerve damage. So my gastrointestinal tract is also mixed up due to polio. But as we age, those symptoms come into play. And I'm hoping as I tell you my symptoms, you'll go, oh, I have that. Maybe I better get that checked out. So at age 18, walking on a campus in college, I had to start to find rest stops in order to be able to walk to class. I just couldn't walk to class. Um, the pregnancies, I had three, exacerbated my polio. I um, actually couldn't deliver my children myself. I ended up with what they call Pitocin drips, which did nothing. <laughs> and then my children were delivered for me. Um, I had during my last pregnancy, um, a, my first recognized nerve impingement disorder, which was carpal tunnel. I had it in both hands. I had surgery three times on this hand, once on this. And it was because I actually worked as a nurse with my orthopedic surgeon and he believed in me and he knew I wanted to go to grad school. So he kept going in my right wrist and cleaning out the scar tissue after the initial carpal tunnel surgery. I was very, very fortunate I was a nurse. The next impingement I disordered, I got is here. I got scars everywhere to show my battle with post polio. Um, in 1984, I started to, um, I was teaching, I had a family um, falling down the stairs. I was tripping over my polio foot. My orthopedic doctor talked with me. He said, I can, you know, put pins here and there. And I'm like, 
I'm a little leery of pins. He said, I can do something else. So he took part of my hip and opened up my ankle with another team of surgeons and put it in my ankle. He also um, did surgery to extend my Achilles tendon, which had shortened. During this time period, I met with a psychologist before the surgery and she taught me relaxation techniques. She knew the pain would be bad. She knew um, that I would wanna deal with it with as least meds as I needed because I had to be able to balance and walk too. It's a, it's a change off. Um, I ended up then after that surgery having more increasing um, weakness on my right side. I got a block on my brake so that I didn't have to press so hard to break the car. Um, but then cold temperatures, I was, I was living in the state of Wisconsin and the cold temperatures were bothering me. The cold brought pain, but it also brought ice and snow and I couldn't stand up in it. So I ended up moving to Florida, to Colorado, to Oregon. Now I'm in Arizona and it's dry heat and it may be 102 today, but I don't feel it like the other people are. So I have to shut up about that because I really don't register that heat as well. But while I've been here, I've certainly noticed that as the day goes on, my brain fatigues faster than it used to when I was younger. I have to take not just my nap that I always do, I'm like very good about that, but I might have to take a little morning nap too. It's getting at my ego doing that, but I have to do it or I can't think. Um, I had a knee replacement here on my good leg which is due to the post-polio osteoarthritis, natural osteoarthritis, but also our post-polio overuse of one leg. So I used my left leg my whole life to be able to get around. I went in for surgery. They did it. My leg got a little longer because of the surgery. They had a very difficult time because um, even though I explained to them about anesthesia in the polio patient, not sure they really got it. Um, and I had two TED stockings on, one which was measured for my polio leg. That was put on my surgical leg and I got blisters all over my leg. So little heads up, if you go to surgery, a few things to remember, ask a nurse. Um, I'm like Mona, I didn't deal with it. I just kept, I'm going on, I'm not talking about it. I'm pre, pre I'm, like um, pretending, I'm pretending I'm all right. Then I marry my husband and he's so full of love. I sat in the spare bedroom and wrote a book about polio and I cried. And I must say, this is a post polio symptom that survivors will tell me. It's the first time they cried and that they told anybody that we've been through a lot. We can't swallow well. For me with spinal bul bulbar, I have to watch my breathing. I have to do breathing exercises every day, preventatively. Um, the things that we do are not always noticeable to other people, but please mark down the things that are bothering you and then get help figuring out how it's related to polio so that someone in the health professional profession can help you. The, I agree with Mona that the biggest help in having post polio is talking with other polio survivors because we understand. We understand how it is to carry this with us our whole lives, to maybe not talk about it till I'm almost 79. I talked about it two years ago. And I urge you all to just Love life as best you can. We had many blessings. Disease can be a gift and I've learned a lot having it. Thank you, Mona. Well, thank you very much for sharing. That was a wonderful sharing. And I think that the people who are listening will also feel that that was an excellent sharing. Um, I have a little video here of another personal story. Ken, can you take it on?
Sorry to tell you this, but you've got post polio syndrome. He said, but don't worry, it's not going to kill you. It's just going to make you weaker and weaker. Okay. It's just part of the polio. It's part of the process. So I don't think the doctors, they know enough about it at all. Because I've been to the doctors with problems. And they, they say, well, we didn't do anything to do with polio when we were at university. That was an old thing. Well, it would help them to understand how you feel, because they don't. They just say, oh, well, it's old age. They just don't know. So they're not educated enough with it. Just to say, they think, oh, polio, that's, that's old, that's finished, it's done with. It's not. There's so many people with polio still living. We're not dead. Um, that, that was quite the video. I know I hear from polio survivors that doctors just dismiss all our complaints. They tell them, they tell people that we're just getting older. Well, we are older, but that's not post polio. Are we prepared when we go to a doctor with the details of our post polio condition to show them? Will they even listen to us? Well, here is a video of a doctor. Uh, it's about a 10 minute video, but it is so informative. I thought it would be really great for you to hear this. Um, listen, see what this doctor says. I found him to be just exceptional. So here you go, Ken. Please put the video on. A number of individuals who've had polio in their younger days are now presenting with a constellation of features which include pain, weakness and fatigue. It's not a reinfection of polio. It's really either a progression of the neurological damage that occurred with the polio when they had their poliomyelitis all those years ago or a consequence of the biomechanical stress and strains that their body has gone through due the original weakness or Post polio syndrome is really a constellation of symptoms that, that I mentioned before weakness, fatigue, and pain, with some other features as well. People may well have swallowing difficulties, respiratory difficulties, temperature changes mood changes, behavioural changes, but it's really an effect of the wearing out of the remaining nerves that were there after the original poliomyelitis infection. I like to think of the late effects of poliomyelitis being a little different to post-polio syndrome, although there are a lot of uh, similarities. But really, the late effects of poliomyelitis are due to the wear and tear on the body and the, the stresses and strains due to the, the original weakness, fatigue, that puts, and the effects then on the rest of the body. The classic example would be arthritis in the left leg when someone has had polio affecting the right leg. It's the extra burden that that left leg has had to carry that's worn it out. I think what you can say is the late effects of polio become more apparent in the non-affected part of the body. So you, you can align, if someone's got a left-sided leg weakness, then you'll see a lot of effects on the right side of the body, which has been used to adapt for that left weakness. But it's not exclusionary. You can have effects on the left side of the body as well. Whereas the post-polio syndrome features tend to be generalised and affect all limbs and it vary in the way it presents, depending on the demands on the body. Mm. 
Not necessarily. It depends on the extent of the original infection, the age of the original infection, and the lifestyle of the individual. We would estimate at least 50% of individuals who did suffer polio, and what I'm talking about when I said say suffer polio, have paralytic polio with some weakness left after the original infection, never report any symptoms. But those who do report symptoms can relate it back to the original infection and the weakness that was that remained after that infection. There's a rule of thumb with post-polio syndrome, and that is that the younger you are, that is under the age of five, and the less severe the attack, the less likely you are to develop post-polio syndrome. You can't say the same thing for the late effects of polio because if you're looking at the biomechanical issues with that, but certainly from that progressive disorder that is known as post-polio syndrome, there is a correlation between the severity of the original presentation and the age. It was really probably the late 80s, early 90s, where a lot of more emphasis uh, was put on the impact of the polio on, the polio on individuals later in their life. But there was a lot of discussion about it even in the 50s, 60s and 70s when polio survivors were starting to not be as efficient in their lifestyles as they previously were. What you have to remember is this is a group of individuals who are very strong-willed and very determined because after their original infection, they had to try and keep up to be normal, whatever normal is. And by that, they had to work at 110% compared to the able-bodied individual who worked at 100%. That's the way they operate. But as they get a bit older, their body doesn't keep up with their mind anymore. And you'll often find that you still have this vibrant, intelligent individual who's striving and striving, but they're getting frustrated because they can't keep up in the same way as they used to. I think probably the first answer is be sensible. Pace yourself, look at your day, conserve energy, be ergonomically smart, set your kitchen up, set your office up, set your car up so that you're not putting extra stresses on your body. Take time out. One of the biggest things that I find that frustrates polio survivors is they have to take 30 minutes out in the day to rest. Because their mindset is of being of someone who wants to do, they see that as wasted time. What I often suggest is, okay, if you need that 30 minutes hour rest in the day physically, pick up the newspaper, pick up a book, book, stimulate your mind, use it, look at it in another way. It's still a time that you can be positive in your lifestyle, but you do need to protect the rest of your body. We believe that that's due to the dropout of neuronal function, so we're losing nerves over time. What happens is after the original infection, the, the remaining nerves have to take on the role of the nerves that have been lost. And they do this by sprouting, for want of a better term, sprouting out to cover more muscle by one nerve. But it's, it's like sending uh, a nine-man soccer team to play an 11-man game. Sooner or later, the nine-man team becomes less efficient. And that's what happens with the body's neuromuscular system, the nerves and muscles, that they become less efficient. And the way that presents is fatigue. You tire. It's overwhelming. It's not just a physical fatigue as well. And that's the thing that people don't necessarily understand. It's often cognitive as well. They just they feel like they're forgetting things. They can't pay attention. And it just comes in a way that it, they basically become, for want of a better term, paralysed totally and too tired to do anything. I think the answer to that simply is it will be with them for the rest of their life. What they need to be able to do is adapt and adjust to meet the demands of their life compared to what the effects of the polio is having on them. And what I mean by that is that you'll often find when initially they're so strong-willed and want to keep battling on that when the symptoms first start occurring, they deny what's happening and force themselves harder, which is really a destructive course. The sensible thing to do would be to sit back and say, 
I can't do this anymore in this way. I need to adapt. But that's not the way we operate in, in our response to a challenge. So the first response is to, I'm going to beat this. But the problem is they don't have the reserves to beat it after time. And it wears them down. And it's often four or five years down the track from the time when they first started having their symptoms that the situation arises and they get into a bit of trouble and then they present. They need to have a balance. Yes, they should be exercising because they need to have the conditioning. If you don't use your muscles, they also weaken. So, But it needs to be a balance of light aerobic activities and maybe some light resisted activities. But you don't do it to the point of exhaustion, which is which tends to be a challenge for the the um, the polio survivor who is an achiever. So you give them a prescription for 10 repetitions of an exercise and they'll do 20 to show you that they're listening to you closely. They want to achieve. You actually don't diagnose it by looking at the person. For, it's a, it's a combination of features. Certainly you do look at the person, examine the person to establish that there's evidence of polio occurring in the past. But you look at the picture, you look at the history, what's been the presentation over the years. They had a period of when they had the initial infection and the recovery with residual weakness, a period of latency where things just steadily went on. They played sport, they had a career, they raised a family. Then all of a sudden, their physical expertise, their general functioning starts to drop off. And you'll often see they adapt to things, they pulled out of doing things that they were doing before. Their fatigue gets greater, their pain gets greater, they feel weaker. And that tends to increase with time. And it's really the combination of those two things will give you most of the answers. If you wanted to find whether a person's really had polio, you may do a study called a, an EMG, which will show that the muscle has been affected. But that doesn't tell you that you've got post-polio syndrome. That only tells you that you've had polio. The, the issue for that for me would be that someone's given a label and everything's then blamed to, on polio. But they're human beings and they can have other conditions as well. So I think we need to be very alert when we look at someone and make sure that we're not missing anything else and putting it all down under polio. And I've had patients present with strokes, multiple sclerosis, orthopedic conditions, which people have attributed to the, the polio diagnosis, late effects of polio diagnosis or polio, post polio syndrome diagnosis, but really there's something else going on. So it's important as a physician or a treating practitioner that you are sensitive to the person. You look at the person holistically, not by the diagnosis. They can have a variety of pains. There can be the specific joint pain, the soft tissue pains. They can have gnawing pain. It can disturb their sleep. They can have what's known as neuropathic pain, which is a burning sensation in various parts of their body. They can have sensations of extremely cold limbs, which at this time of year in, in winter is particularly problematic and very difficult to treat. They can have anxiety associated with the pain because the pain is stopping them doing things and being individuals who like being in control. They can set up a pain syndrome. So there's a lot of ways that the pain presents. Usually what the person will present with, though, is the pain stopping them doing a particular function or activity that they like doing. Well, usually an individual will have a weak limb, which may be getting weaker but they also find that they're getting weaker in other limbs. One of the problems is when we medically examine someone, we often do what we call a confrontational test, where we just test it once or twice. But if you look at what happens with the polio survivor, they can do the activity for a while and the weakness sets in. So when we really test people, we should test them functionally and re repeat the activity a number of times to watch the, the propagation of the, the weakness. <clears throat> there is a correlation with respiratory difficulties and polio. Polio survivors often get labelled as having asthma or like, but it often can be due to restrictive lung disease because of weakness in the muscles or changes in the thoracic spine or chest wall. And that needs a respiratory physician involved. 
Sleep apnea, where they have problems with breathing overnight, is often complained about, particularly by their partner who says they're snoring all the time. And that needs to be addressed with a sleep study because there are mechanisms to manage that now. The problem if you have obstructive sleep apnea is you don't oxygenate your body correctly and you don't wake up refreshed and that can aggravate your fatigue. So if you treat the obstructive sleep apnea, that can improve that as well. Sometimes you've got to address the psychological issues of the loss of control. You're talking about in individuals, i.e. polio survivors, who have managed their life. They've taken control. They've held their own destiny. All of a sudden, this process of fatigue, weakness, pain, whatever, starts robbing them of doing that. And that takes a lot of adjustment from a, from a psychological perspective. And sometimes counselling needs to be undertaken as well. Um, that's a that's a very good question because it's it's hard to know because often the, the individuals are unaware or don't want to know about these diagnoses to start with. But probably the simplest answer is sensible living, exercising correctly, not overstressing your body, diet dieting correctly, having regular medical checkups to make sure you're healthy. Dare I say, good clean living. <laughs> Well, sorry about the over uh, dubbing of this video. I didn't know. Oh, it's still happening. Yes. Um, our producer, is there any way to fix the sound? I'm still hearing it. Ken, I don't hear you. Can you mute it? I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's happening at this point. It's, it's some type of a technical problem. So I'm we sadly we'll have to live with it at the moment. So. We can hear you clearly. We will continue and hopefully this will uh, clear itself up. Um, that video um, is Polio Australia. Just check YouTube. Polio Australia has a number of excellent videos, and that's why I wanted to put uh, Dr. Graf on. He's the doctor that we all want to have. Although he's <laughs> in Australia, there are, there are doctors right here in America who um, are as considerate. Let's try and find them all. Um, resting. Now, that's a really good word. Resting is not easy for us. Polio kids grew up learning to overachieve. It goes against our grain. We sometimes act like we know all about polio. We thought <laughs> we beat polio. Susie, what's your secret to resting? <laughs> I started it out young, but maybe that's because I had polio so young. And I think actually um, it was good for the whole family that I rested because they gave, it gave them a break from the polio kid. Um, so literally I have taken naps my whole life. I still between 11.30 a.m. moaning osis and 1.30 p.m. I'm generally not available. Give you an example of breaking that rule was last week, took a friend to her neurologist because she has a brain tumor. Her appointment was at one o'clock, blew that afternoon off. And the next day I could hardly make up for it. It just doesn't work. Um, my husband is very good at saying, Susie, you look uh, tired. Maybe you need to lay down this morning too. I'm fortunate that way because it's very hard to tell yourself you want to do all these things, but the result is always negative. It's always a burden if you don't take the rest, period. At least for me, I must speak for myself. So I pace throughout the day. My exercise is paced. I swim laps in the morning. I come home and rest. Um, if I'm cooking, like today I'm cooking, I already cooked the salmon part of the meal. I'm resting with you guys. I'll cook another part of the meal. 
I'll rest. Maybe my rest will be doing my physical therapy floor exercises because they help my spine. I'll rest. Then I'll make the other part of the meal. By five o'clock tonight, when our guest comes, all I have to do is microwave it. Other days of the week, my husband and I are mostly vegetarian. So we're into bowl meals, which take just about nothing to prepare <laughs> and are much easier on my spine. Um, when the um, doctor talked about people having EMGs and understanding their polio better, in the 1990s, I had an EMG with a polio doctor and um, learned that my right side was more affected than I even thought. And I can tell you today, I have been ambidextrous my whole life, but maybe somehow my brain figured out it had to be because I don't, I didn't ask it to be, <laughs> but I am getting weak around the right side all the time. So I have to rest it. That's and you're right. Not fun. Not fun, but it works. The rest it works. does work. Now that post polio has entered our lives, we may pay the price of overdoing it. Non-stop activity often brings increased pain and hard to recover from exhaustion. Mm -hmm. The ritual of rest, as Susie pointed out at another talk, almost everything will work again if you unplug for a few mm -hmm. minutes, including yourself. Rest mm -hmm. is the best, best medicine. When we see how regular rest can prevent or calm pain, clear our minds and ease our anxiety, we respect it more. Why not? Why is rest so important now? Because the neurons which stimulate muscles to work were damaged by the polio virus. Some neurons sprouted new channels to muscles. This helped polio survivors for a time. Now with post polio, the newly sprouted neurons are becoming older and weakened. Rest allows neurons to recover, so our muscles can work again safely. A little rest here and there can prevent an accident. One accident can change a person's life dramatically. Each polio survivor is wise to rest in spurts throughout the day, just as Susie was telling us, despite our ingrained polio survivor <laughs> thinking that taking a break goes against giving the day our all. Some of the questions we polio survivors need to ask ourselves, am I willing to rest? What does rest look like? What modifications can I make so rest can happen? The doctor even mentioned, you know, read a newspaper, uh, watch some TV, just let your body rest. Now, change. Change is so hard. Change is my new swear word. It's not easy for us to change. But change is not only possible, but for us polio survivors, it's essential if we are going to enjoy our healthy lives and continue to enjoy our lives. Change first requires us to move towards doing something different. We may not like it at first. Consciously slowing down is not in our nature. Susie, how have you changed? How have I changed? Um, <laughs> I've slowed down a great deal. And just like you say, it's emotionally difficult, emotionally difficult. Um, and I, my husband is my best partner in this because he will just look at me across. We have our computers like back to back and he'll say, Susie, you're getting too tired. <laughs> and I follow, I mean, I have hobby, I've added hobbies though. Because you're saying like read a book. I have to read a book that's really a, a mystery or something that isn't nonfiction because my brain can't work while I'm reading the book. And it, it needs to be a book I enjoy. It needs to be something I don't have to remember. 
but I've also taken up doing volunteer work, making recyclable products that we give away in our community to people. Um, and it takes no brains. I'm working on a sewing machine. It's making a buzzing noise, which helps. It re the vibration of a serger sewing machine relaxes me. So I've had to add those things, even though I don't want to. I've had to move away. I was a nursing instructor. I had to retire. I still belong to the university and tutor students, but it's not. It's it's easier because it's my schedule. The students have to, if they want me to help them, there's obligations that come with that. And I'm, I give them all those ahead and explain why. Excellent. Those are very good ways. It wasn't easy for you and it's not easy for me. And it's certainly not easy for those that are watching this video. Um, exploring alternatives helps with making the change to rest easier. How can I change the outside of my house so I use less energy to get inside? How can my car be modified to automatically move my wheelchair atop the car or into the trunk? How can I get over that step into my house without a lot of remodeling? Are there shower hoses that can be affixed to the shower wall so I don't need to get reach up can I get my bathtub removed and replaced with a walk-in shower? Is it possible to change the shelving to roll out? And so I don't need to bend down to get those pots and pans. Yikes. It hurts my spine just thinking about it. <laughs> Can my cooking ware be changed out for lighter types, such as aluminum pots and pans? Or can somebody else do the cooking? <laughs> <laughs> Might I consider doing a le doing less a hobby that brings me pain, such as cooking and baking, mm -hmm. and swap it for something like sewing or painting? That mm -hmm. was my alternative. Then by resting those tired muscles, they can recover somewhat and follow through with a little more activity. Sometimes it takes a few minutes of just stop, drop, and rest to walk another few steps. That's just enough time to get to safety. Patience is another, is another way to analyze what works best. How do we know what works and what doesn't work to help us achieve rest? If we do not take the time to think about it, we'll never be able to figure it out. One way to figure out how, when to rest they help lessen the pain. Mm -hmm. And we have a chart. It's called the old cart pain or the old cart fatigue. I can send it to you. Send me your email. Our, our line is going to be, our my email will be out there. Ken, can you put the banner on? Slow down, walk less, use assistive devices, to help you move, the use of canes, walkers, chairs, wheelchairs, etc. And best of all, caregivers, they want to help you. They really <laughs> do. You just have to ask them. Get your medical care and the prognosis. My own doctor back in 1994 wrote with Grimley, Dr. Trojan, 1994 in Montreal, Post-polio is slowly progressive. Muscle fatigue and subjective fatigue may stabilize over time. Management and rehabilitation has shown to slow or even stop the progress of symptoms and improve the function and quality of life for polio survivors. questions to ask yourself. We're just about out of time. The time of day when you feel fatigue. What part of your body is most tired? How long does the fatigue last? Fatigue is a short-lived intermittent or scattered throughout the day. Find out when you feel what you're feeling. That's the only way we can follow through. 
Susie has written up a wonderful old cart chart. Please write to me. I will send it to you. It's excellent. It shows these things and we need to talk about it. I can also give you the URL to an article that a colleague of mine and I published that tells about the how you use the chart. I want to say, Susie, thank you so much for being here, for, hey, helping, well. <laughs> for helping me to put this program together and for polio people for listening and seeing what we can do for ourselves. We always helped ourselves. Help yourself now, even more important. We want to enjoy our life and we know that polio people last a very long time. We are here. <laughs> And we have polio people into their mid nineties and they're still functioning and they're still capable. Let's keep going. We need each other. I want to say thank you. Thank you, Susan, again. Thank and you. thank you all for being here. This has been a wonderful experience. We will be here next month and next month we will answer some of those questions that we asked today. Thank you and goodbye.